الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا
Start on the hour or the half hour, either way. And then we run yeah, for one hour. We don't want to delay it until 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock is very late after my break. So 6 30 will be better. Okay, and then you cut it off at 7 30. Yeah. 7 30, yes. Okay, well, we can continue the program if you need to. We just need to know before we start exactly how many seconds. So we'll know it. Because if we have a timer in the, yeah. in the studio, we, we, we connect to the internet. And that will put it on exactly, and then cut it off exactly. <coughs> Even if I'm talking, it'll... Okay. <laughs> um, so if you want to go later than 7.30, that's, uh, that's no, fine. No, we've got to be 7.30 to 8.30, or 8 to 9, 10 to 11, like this. It has to be exactly one hour. One hour. الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استقيم ويرحمكم الله الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين والضحى والليل إذا سجى ما ودعك ربك وما قلى وللآخرة خير لك من الأولى ولسوف يعطيك ربك فترضى ألم يجدك يتيما فآوى ووجدك ضال 
ضلا فهدى ووجدك عائلا فأغنى فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائل فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحدث الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر <تصفيق> الله أكبر الله أكبر بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين ألم نشرح لك صدرك ووضعنا عنك وزرك الذي أن قضى ظهرك ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإن مع العسر يسرا إن مع العسر يسرا فإذا فرغت فانصب وإلى ربك فارغب الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر
الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم الحمد لله نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم أما بعد uh, at uh, 6.30, uh, Sheikh uh, Yusuf Estes will be speaking, inshallah, and for an hour. Uh, so we have uh, very little time uh, to start with. Uh, uh, prayer sunnah, and then inshallah he will start. 6.30. Uh, I think he needs uh, no introduction. Uh, Sheikh Yusuf Estes has been here to this community previously, and he is well known otherwise also. Uh, we welcome him. We welcome also Sheikh uh, uh, Muhammad Hassan, uh, who gave the khutbah earlier today, uh, as well as the other uh, brothers who came with them and are helping out here. Jazakumullah.
One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Uh, yes, absolutely. I need my medicine. Zakalachem.
You gotta wrap this twice, don't you? There we go. Uh, does anybody know about the internet? Is there internet here in the building? How fast is it? Up, 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 up. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam wa rasulullah wa ala alihi wa sabiha ajma'in nashadu wa la ilaha illallah wa atala shriqa Allah wa ashadu wa muhammadin abduhu wa rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Assalamu alaikum Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen in just a few seconds we should be live on the air on Guidus TV and other sources as well Guidus TV, just to give you a little bit of information about it, some of you already know. How many already heard about Guidus TV? Oh, man, I feel good. I remember the first time that I asked when I came to, uh, I was in New York, actually, Queens, and I said, how many of you heard about Guidus TV? Two people raised their hand. And what's amazing is because a lot of the support was coming from that community, and I said, if these are the people that donate, for what we're doing, and they don't even know what it is. <laughs> That's pretty bad. But alhamdulillah, most of you know something called Guidance TV. The channel has grown. Now we are on satellite all over the United States and Canada, but also we're on things like Sharp TV. When it comes out, it has it built in. And some of the others that have, like Roku Box and Hulu and things like this, You'll find that Guidance TV is on some of those. The, we were on the all the smartphones, but now we're only on the ones that, well, the iPhone is the one we're not on right now. And the reason, because we're having to redo the app. They have some new regulations about security, blah, blah, blah. So you know how that is with the blah, 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 right? And as soon as we get that done, oh, and uh, no matter what you do with iPhone apps, they always send it back and you gotta do it again. Doesn't matter. I think they work for the government, I don't know. And uh, speaking of that, while we're on the air, no jokes about the government. No jokes about the president. But if I tell one, be sure to laugh, okay? Alhamdulillah. We've had a, a series of real strange things happening around the world today, a lot of it affecting Muslims directly and indirectly, and I think most of you know about it. The one thing I would like to encourage all the people, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, I'd like to encourage everybody to consider the source and don't get involved in saying or doing things that will not help the cause. And especially if it's going to hurt you or your family, don't do it. Don't say anything. Just keep it to yourself. The, our Prophet Sallallahu encouraged us to do like this, and I think it's very smart for us to be prudent when it comes to these subjects, uh, even privately. It, it's no benefit to make fun of people, although some people make it so easy to make fun of them. You know what I mean? But still, it's not a good thing in Islam to do that. And it's not a good thing to teach our children to do that. They have enough of that nonsense when they go on the internet as it is. And I don't want to encourage more of that. Ready when you're ready, Chief. By the way, thank you, brother, for helping us with that. Jazakallah khair. Also, uh, one of the things that is coming up more and more is about people leaving Islam. And this is happening. This is happening, but don't think that Allah doesn't know what's going on. Because our Prophet ﷺ predicted this exact same thing 1400 years ago. If you think about this, I, I want to make you think of something, especially our youth, to think about something that's right now today. If you went to the racetrack and there's horses running around the racetrack, and you're going to guess which one of those horses is going to win the race. Maybe they have 10 or 12 horses. Out of 10 or 12 horses, you probably will not guess right. Even if somebody's telling you, for sure we think this horse is going to win, it probably won't. Is that true or false? Yeah. 
And I'm in New Jersey. I know people bet on stuff all the time over here, right? But it's haram. Anyway, the thing that I'm saying is, how could you, in looking in front of you at something living and tell me what it's going to do? Sometimes the horse won't even make it out of the chute. Sometimes it'll fall over before it gets to the end. And a lot of times it will lose the race. But our Prophet ﷺ is telling us something 1,400 years ago. And you can see it today. What's the biggest, tallest building in the whole world today? Where is it located? In a desert? Huh? Is it in a desert? Yeah, and that's exactly what he said. And is anybody trying to build a bigger building? I just came from there two days ago. And I saw the building that they're trying to build bigger than it, which is in Jeddah. This temporary stopped while somebody's taking a vacation or whatever. Everybody knew what I meant, right? Yeah, right. And when he gets out of his vacation, then he'll go back to work on it. But anyhow, what I'm saying is that this was predicted by our Prophet Sallallahu not just that they would be in the desert, not just that they would be by people who just recently, like within the last hundred years, were, were very poor Bedouins living in the desert. hundred years ago, these people lived in a khima tent in the desert. Is it just you talking? Is it just you talking? Yeah, it's just me. Oh, okay. Well, then just clip it on. Is there a gin or something? Does that mean? I don't know how to do that. Oh, you mean clip it on me? Yes, sir. Oh, I can do that. You just clip it on me. You get your one more microphone and you'll be ready to work. One more for what? For the FBI. Oh, that's right. Don't need one for CIA. I thought we had to be split that up. That's next week. Next week, okay. <coughs> You're ten minutes late. So our Prophet Sallallahu he told us about this fourteen hundred years ago, and he, the way he said it in Arabic, it means they're competing against each other. Competing. Like a contest to see who can build the tallest building in the desert. A desert is where you have the cheapest land in the world. So you build out. You don't build up. Because it's cheap. Why do you build the tall building? Well, in Manhattan you can figure it out. Because there's no more land. You just have to keep going up. But you're in the desert. That nobody can even see the end of it. And why would you do that? Competition, just to say I built one taller than you did. And I've talked to some of the brothers over there. They were doing this kind of construction. And I said, why, why are you doing it? They said, to make it bigger. I said, the, this one is empty, and this one is empty, and you're going to build a bigger one? Yeah. Don't you care if it's empty? No, I just want it to be bigger. And who said that? But it's a sign of the last days. That's what the Prophet was saying. He wasn't just saying, I can predict something and watch this. He didn't, that wasn't the idea. It's a sign of the last days. Today we know about something else that is in uh, the area of embryology, where they're able to take a seed or uh, an egg, they call it egg, from a woman and put it in another woman. And then that egg can be fertilized by the sperm of the husband of the first lady. And put that in this lady and then she's going to conceive and have a baby. And she has the baby and then they take it from her because it's not your baby, it's our baby. And this way the lady whose egg it is doesn't want to lose her shape, you know, by having a baby and stretching out and all. So, so let this other lady have that. And that lady works for them. Actually, she has got a paper saying she's an indentured servant. They don't want to say slave, okay? Indentured servant. 
And they do that. And guess what? Prophet Islam, he also mentioned that when a slave girl gives birth to her own master. And it's happening today. It's not a, a subject to discuss about, oh, is that right or wrong? That's not even the point. The point is what? He said it. And he said what it means. The last days. So this is where we are. He also said, now I said this to tell you the next part. He also said that in the last days, there's not going to be any more religions. There's just going to be Islam, and that's a way of life, not just a religion. There's going to be Islam, wakufr, and disbelief. So how is that going to happen? And what we see today the fastest growing religion is what? And the fastest, but something bigger than that is a group of people who are growing very fast. What is it? Mulhideen in Arabic, atheist, exactly. I'm ready when you're ready, Chief. Just call it out. In the Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, you are watching Guidus TV coming to you live all the way from New Jersey. That's right. We tried to find old Jersey, couldn't find it, so we came to the New Jersey. Never mind all that story. You're watching Guidus TV and, uh, of course, yours truly. I'm here with our brothers. And I guess we have some sisters somewhere, too, huh? Yeah? They're in the, uh, they're in the luxury area, all right? We're just sitting on the floor. All right. Cool stuff. So we're here and it's live. Everybody's still live? Nobody died in here. That's good. I like that. And I've got my medicine. Guide us coffee. That's a good medicine to have. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. We're talking on the subject right now about things that are happening in the world around us. One of the things that we see in the news, a lot of people talking about, is, what, is Islam. This is a big subject. Islam is a very, very big subject for everybody around the world. I don't think you can pick up a newspaper or watch any newscast except that somebody's going to be talking about Islam or Muslims or something about Quran or the Hadith or Sharia. And usually not very nice things they say, but that's beside the point. They're talking about Islam, right? And even though some things that people are saying are really negative, it still makes people go to check it out. I want to go to the library and read about this religion, boy. These guys are crazy. And then they go and they open up the Quran and the translations and they read it and they become a Muslim. Is anybody in this room uh, that used to be some other religion and now they're Muslim? Raise your hands up. Whoa. Whoa, all right. Okay, alhamdulillah. Did I describe it pretty close? That what you heard before was like, Bleh! and now you do anything to be a Muslim, right? Everything is Islam. SubhanAllah. I know how it feels. God did the same thing. I heard about these guys that, you know, don't believe in God. They worship a black box in the desert. They kiss the ground five times a day. They don't believe in Jesus. <laughs> and I come to find out, not only do we as Muslims believe in Isa, salam, which was his real name, but on top of that, we know he's coming back in the last days. We know that. If we don't believe in his miracle birth, if we don't believe that he was able to do miracles by the permission of Almighty God, if we don't believe that he prophesied things that were to come, and if we don't believe he told about the comforter who would come after him, if we don't want to believe that, we can't be a Muslim. But we even know some of the things that the Bible didn't mention. For instance, how amazing is his mother? A lot of people don't know that we, of course, we don't worship his mother. We don't worship him. We worship the God that they worshiped. But we have such a high status for her above any other woman that ever lived. 
Maryam or Mary is mentioned in Quran as the best of all the women that Allah ever created. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. And then on top of that, we know when Isa, Jesus, peace be upon him, is coming back on a certain time, not the date. By the way, I don't mean we know the date, but we know the conditions which will exist. We were talking about that before we came on the air, that there would be Arabs, poor Arabs, tent dwellers living in the desert. All of a sudden, they would be building the tallest buildings in the world in competition to each other. Huh. Is that true they're doing that? Oh, well, we found out, guess what? In a place called Dubai, in the United Arab Emirates, there is a building called Khalifa Towers, Burj Khalifa. I've been there. And then when you go, it, it doesn't look like it's real. Because you can see the top of it even before you get close to the city. And as you get closer and closer, all you see is that there's no city. It's just this pencil sticking up. It looks like a silver pencil. And the closer you get, then you see more of it, more of it. And finally you see some of the buildings down below it. It's tall. But now, only about a 45-minute drive in a taxi from Mecca, where Muhammad was, where he was born and grew up, to a place called Jeddah in Saudi Arabia. That's that close. They're building another building right now to be taller than the one in Dubai. And I'm not supposed to say this on the air, so I'll whisper it. So maybe, you know, I won't be in too much trouble. But most of those big buildings are half empty. Whoop. So why would you build a big building just to be empty? And I asked some of the people who do that. They said, to be taller. Okay, well. Some people have <clears throat> more folding money than change. Do you know what that means? Another way to say that? Some people have more dollars than cents. Was that out loud? Anyhow. The idea that I'm talking about is that the, the signs of the times, the predictions that have been made, are coming true. Many of the things that we've been talking about here tonight, we have realized that this is not is this is not possible for anybody to guess that all these things would be happening at the same time. But how about this? I want you to consider this. The fastest growing group of people in the world. Now somebody sitting at home is probably thinking, mm-hmm, he's talking about Islam, fastest growing religion. I didn't say religion though, did I? I said group. The group which is getting more people joining that group on a daily basis is not Islam. It's in Arabic called mulhidin, which means atheism. Exactly. That's exactly right. People who are in disbelief. And what's strange, if you tell them, because I have done this, I've said, you know that you're the fastest growing group. They said, really? We are? Yeah, you are. But this was predicted 1,400 years ago by the prophet of Islam. He spoke about you. And they're like, oh, really? He must have been very smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, whatever. This is an indication of somebody who really doesn't want to know or to be guided. The people who want to know, the one that want to be guided, if they said, if there's a God, then guide me. And by the way, that's where we got the name of the TV channel. Guide us. We say that every day maybe 17 times a day, maybe more. Hmm? Guide us, guide us. Yeah. 
Subhanallah. How about this? Prophet Sallallahu is talking about people who want to be guided and they get guided. And people who don't want to be guided and they're not. It all starts in here. What do you want? Because this is the place you can get it. Right here on earth. Whatever you want, you can get it. You want to be guided? You got it. You want to be misguided? You won't be guided. Simple as that. Anyway, to come back to the subject about these last days and these groups, our prophet, peace be upon him, told us that in the last days that all the religions are going to be gone. Except what? Islam. And the only other group will be kufr, which means no belief. Actually, kufr technically, I'll show you a demonstration. You want to see, you want to see kufr? Watch. This is kufr. Not my coffee, not the jug, but this is kafara. I covered it. The word cover in English is very close to the word kafar in Arabic, meaning to cover something. So it means hiding or covering up. And they used to use this, check this out. You like to learn things about words, especially Arabic words. So they used this to describe a person who's digging the ground, dropping seeds in the ground, then he covers it up with the dirt. So are the seeds really there? Yes. And he covered it up. Got it? So this is an act of kafara, and the one who does it is a kafir. And that's what they used to call farmers. But after Islam came, they didn't want to be called kafir anymore for obvious reasons. <laughs> I said, don't go to Saudi Arabia and you see a guy driving a tractor or running with his horse or doing something, say, hey, Kafir, how you doing? It's not going to work. <laughs> I like a lot of words that get different assignments. The word has a meaning when it starts and it gets changed and changed and rechanged. When I was a boy, if you said that you had an uncle who was really happy, you know, because he's gay, it would mean something different today than what I said about 60 years ago. <laughs> Just to understand words alone is something good. But to understand the predictions of the Prophet Islam is, of course, a lot better. And what did he predict that would happen? He told us about this day when people would be in two groups, only two groups, belief and disbelief. So much so that the one who is the disbeliever will see the believer and he will say, hey, believer. And the other one would say to him, hey, disbeliever, hey, kafir. And there would be no problem. Then the Prophet, Salaam, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he told us that some people would even have kafara on their head. Now, I thought when I read it, and because I asked some of the scholars about this, I thought, well, eh, what does that mean? Maybe it means in his mind. And then on his chest, okay, so it means in his heart, right? So on his mind, his heart. No, for real. In England, there are people who really hate Muslims so much and hate Islam they had it tattooed up here Kafir Kafir and on their shirt said I'm a Kafir if you don't believe what I just told you go to a search engine like Google and type in T dash shirt t-shirt okay then K-A-F-R and watch what happens You'll be shocked. You can also put it in English letters if you don't want to use the Arabic and just say, I'm a cat bar, like that. Don't say that, but I mean, you know, type that. Because you'll be surprised 
How many people over there, they think they're proud of that. Look, look, I don't believe anything. And even some Muslims, they left Islam. And they did that. Now, that's something that Muslims don't like to talk about. In fact, they don't even want to believe it. Until somebody that they know has that experience that goes out of Islam. Then what? This is a reality. And if you understand a reality, this is not something you should avoid talking about. You should bring that up with the right people. I mean, don't, you don't have to go make a website and say, uh, who would like to leave Islam? That's not smart. But to talk to scholars about this subject and see, number one, is it true? And number two, what can we do about this? What, what should we do? Should we get mad? Should we get upset? Actually, if you're going to get upset or mad at anybody, guess who it should be? Yourself. Yeah, because obviously we as Muslims are not doing the right job. Most of the time when I get a chance to talk to somebody who said they left Islam, I ask them, tell me about it. Tell me this. Tell me what's going on. Almost every time, the subject will come up how somebody treated them or mistreated them. This is the subject. We had one. I'll give you one example. One, he came to Islam, and he's in the uh, motion picture business in California. And he's a really nice person, really, really nice. And not real famous because the people who make movies are not the famous one. The people, the stars are the famous one, right? But I know him. And I took him to the masjid. And he has some really nice equipment that he, and I was thinking it would help, you know, broadcasting. But while we were there, now imagine this. He took off his shoes, like you're supposed to do when you go in. Nobody had to tell him. He was careful how he moved his equipment around, didn't disturb anybody while they're praying. He set up the equipment, like you see some of our equipment here, his was massive, big looking, nice, you know, big cameras, everything. And he was working really hard to do the best perfect job he could do. And this is a producer, and usually producers don't do the camera work, but he wanted to do it himself to help get reward for Allah I like this then you know what we say uncle you know what we mean by somebody's the uncle yeah You're not really your uncle but it's a nice way to call somebody an, an uncle yeah told him as as he was packing it up he came to him he said we don't do that in here like this and hurt his feelings he's very sensitive so when he packed it all up, he said, I, I promise I won't come back. I promise. Good. Good. Never go back to the masjid. We're still friends. We still talk. But he doesn't want to go around Muslims. Why? Because the way we treat him. And I have seen many women come into Islam and for this exact same reason, the mistreatment, they go away. Strangely enough, strangely enough, when I talk to them, I find out they still do have a belief in Allah. But they have no consideration for Muslims anymore. If you don't talk about this subject, if you try to hide this subject, it gets worse. Anytime there is a disease... And you don't want to admit it. You just try to cover it up. Don't you think it's going to get worse? Shouldn't you go to the doctor? Am I wrong? Huh? I found even some imams, they don't want to talk about the subject. Oh, like that. But if I don't ask you, if I don't talk about it, how will I know what to do? How old are you? Twelve years old. Okay, when I was your age exactly... I used to ask questions about religion. And you know what I heard a lot of times? Just believe. Just have faith. 
And if I ask a complicated question, it'd be like, are you losing your faith? Just be quiet. Now, I was a Christian, but that doesn't mean anything. Because I've heard this same thing from the Jewish faith, the Hindu faith, and Muslims. Same thing. Tell the children, just be quiet. Just don't ask that. Anybody here heard the same thing? Be honest. You heard it? Yes. And don't admit it if you did it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> don't admit that. Try to keep it cool. This is a serious thing. Because on the day of judgment, Allah, he will ask us how we treated each other. And when I say each other, I'm not just talking about Muslims, treating Muslims, which is very important, no doubt. How about how do you treat other people? Not Muslims. How do you treat your next door neighbor who makes dirty faces at you every time you come up? Maybe your wife getting out with her hijab on or, you know, and they, they look at you like, ugh, ugh. So how do you treat him? Huh? Maybe even throw some garbage on your yard. You, you call the police, say, hey, this guy threw garbage on my yard. Is that, is that the good way to do that? Let me give you an example about somebody. You guys at home, I want you to hear this one too. Pay attention. So there was somebody a long time ago that used to have people put his stuff on his doorstep. None of it was not just garbage. It had stuff in there like, you know, thorns and things that could hurt your feet. You go out the door, oh, ow, ooh, ouch, okay? And do it every day. Every day we'll come out and step in this stuff and have to move it away, move it away. How would you feel? Wait a minute, I'm not done. I want you to see how he treated, this is a person giving us a good example of Islam. How did he treat that person who did it? He knew who it was. In fact, one day he came out and there was nothing on the doorstep. So what did he do? He went to the one who was doing that and he said, are you okay? He found he was sick. And he went in to help and take care of this person. The one who puts this junk on his doorstep. How? How could somebody do this? And the one said, you know, I'm the one who's putting this stuff on your doorstep. He said, yeah, I know that. That's how I knew that something wrong because you didn't do it today. Who would do such a thing? Somebody did something bad to you, but you did something good to them. Who would do it? I will tell you who would do it. A good Christian. Because that's in their book. And a good Muslim, because the one I told you about is actually Muhammad. Peace and blessing be upon him. He did that. Now he had enemies. Did Muhammad have enemies? And Jesus had enemies. Every single prophet had enemies. But you know who the worst enemies are? The ones in your own camp. Musa, alayhi salam, Moses. Did he have enemies? Ho oh, ho! But he actually went to Pharaoh. Pharaoh, the leader of all of Egypt at that time. Who was telling people he was a god. Musa alayhi salam, Moses could go to him and tell him things and get a better treatment from Pharaoh than he could get from his own people. Is that true or false? Pharaoh would listen to him. He would even say, you know, I, I buy that. And then as soon as he would leave, he'd say, no, I changed my mind. But then it came about after they escaped from Pharaoh that Allah brought him up on top of the mountain, wanted him up there to give him the Ten Commandments is what the, they talk about. It's more than that. But anyway, when he comes back down after being up there for a long time, what did he find? That his own people were turning against him and worshiping a golden calf that they made themselves. It's in the Bible. It's in the Quran. Same story, but we're going to have to break from our story for a minute because we have what's called a break. Now, I don't want you to break anything. This is called a break for the 
folks at home so they can run out to the kitchen and make a sandwich, something like that. Make it a short sandwich because it's a short break. Stay there. Stay guided with Guidus TV. Thank you. All right. The, this break is only about, what, a minute? So it's, you don't have time to go make a sandwich, okay? Stay right there. The stories that I'm telling are more for the benefit of the millions of people watching at home. Around the world, we do have so many people watching us on social media now. Even, uh, I think we have about three quarters of a million people just on one Facebook account. We have about nine or 10 Facebook accounts, Twitter accounts, LinkedIn, so and so. And imagine with that, that and the television channels that we've got. One of the things that I would like to tell you about in this quick break is we're coming out with something, we call it Halal TV Box. Halal TV Box. It has about 70 channels. We're only one of them. Of course, we put ourselves near the top. We put Quran number one. People can go there and listen to Quran, see what it says. Oh, here's one right here. You can put that in your pocket. You can take it on the road. I take it on the road with me. I can put it in my pocket. The lady can put it in her purse. And when you get where you're going, just plug. There's three wires that come with it. One goes to the electricity. One goes to the internet. And one goes to the TV. You can. 30? All right. So you can plug it in. And then what you can you watch? Of course, the Quran. You can watch Guidance TV. We have Peace TV. We have Huda TV. We've got Chinese language, yeah, a lot of Arabic language, different ones that we have on there. So, and you can find out more about it after the program, we'll tell you about it, okay? And Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, we are back, we're talking about the, first of all, we were talking about what's happening in the world today, but we're also mentioning things that happened in the world a long time ago, and how these things lead up. But I want to now address a situation. What do you do when you find that somebody that you care about, you really care a lot about them, but they no longer choose to believe the way you believe? I would like to encourage everybody watching, regardless of what your faith is today, no matter what, this works for everybody. I'm giving the same advice to myself that I'm giving to everybody, regardless of your faith or belief. First thing is, consider the faith that you have and prove to yourself that it's right. Because if you said, well, it's right for me, well, that's, that's good and nothing wrong with that. But is it real? Because if you can't prove it, if you have no testable evidence for it, then it's called blind faith. Taqlid in the Arabic language. It means that you don't really have a direction that you're basing it on anything more than just blind following. And this is not encouraged in Islam, nor is it encouraged in uh, uh, when people take psych classes or if you go to the university. They want you to Prove up what you're saying. What's the proof? Now, in Psych 101, if you take psychology, you go to a, a university and they have this, then what's going to happen, they will ask you, can you prove you exist? Anybody ever heard that question before? Huh? Yeah. Can you prove you exist? Well, the first time I heard that, I thought, well, that's a dumb question. Usually we say there's a lot of dumb answers, but in this case it was a dumb question. Can you prove you exist? It's like, you, are you not understanding the words that you're using? Because if you can't prove you exist, then there's some basic things that you don't understand about life. Why do, first of all, why do I need to prove to anybody I exist? I mean, you can hear me, you can see me, you can touch me, if you want to. <laughs> so you have sensory perception, seeing, hearing, 
tasting, smelling, feeling. All of these things are sensory that you, you pick something up, you feel it, you taste something. You can tell the difference between really good coffee and, uh, mm, and not really good coffee. I just use that as an excuse to drink that without people figuring out, you know. Anyway, so what I'm getting at, though, if you can see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, see it, so on, all of that proves something exists. But this is the excuse that some people use not to believe in God. And I respect that. I respect it because they'll say, I don't see, I don't hear, I don't smell, I don't taste, I don't feel, so I don't believe. Okay, that's good. But what about thinking? Now this is not a perception, but it's just common sense. I'm going to ask you about thinking. Are you able to think? Yes. All right. So I will encourage you to use this before you use this. Because if you ask me the question, can I prove I exist? I will ask you a question. Why do you need me to prove anything to you? I'm happy with what I got going on over here, but why do you have a problem? Do you think I don't exist? Because you can put your hand out and feel, which is what you just said. You don't believe something because of that. These are the same people that say, don't believe in God. They say, you can't prove you exist. Well, if you're my professor and you're asking me this question, are you serious? You really want to know? Is this really your question? You really are asking this question? Okay. He said yes? All right. So if you don't mind, sir, if you just give me an A for the course, we'll see you later. What? Yeah, because if you don't see me, you don't feel me, you don't touch me, you don't, uh, you know, hear anything, you don't think that I exist or you don't think you exist, just sign me off for the course, okay, because it won't matter. But give me an A. I, I need one. Make sense? See you later. Have fun. But reality is real simple. You can prove you exist. You know how? Go to New York City. And pull out your phone. And try to drive your car with your phone in your hand and see what happens. You'll know you exist. You know how? Because when that cop car pulls you over and gives you a ticket. How did he know you were there? <laughs> In other words, don't be stupid. That is really a dumb question. What they're trying to do is knock you off your game, so to speak, so that you will be ready for them to ask you at the end of the first class. They'll say, is there anybody here who still believes in God? They do that. And I've known, because I go to a lot of universities, I've known about these professors and what they do, and I've seen it. That a Muslim would sit there and go, yeah, well, I better not raise my hand. But I don't want to look stupid. Actually, you look really stupid if you don't raise your hand because, first of all, as a Muslim, you know Allah is seeing everything you're doing all the time. And he just asks you if you believe in Allah and you didn't put up your hand. I mean, I don't want Allah asking me about that question on the Day of Judgment. I don't care what grade this guy gives me. <laughs> I care about what's going to happen to my grade on Yamukiyama. Hello. So we, we need to think what we're doing. Okay, I encourage that. But I want to come back now to something that's a little bit more serious. I've been playing and having fun with that story. But this is very serious. What do I say to the 12-year-old who asked me a question? Can you prove that God exists? Don't blow that question off. Deal with that question. And if you don't know how to deal with it, I will give you a website. Share, S-H-A-R-E, Islam, I-S-L-A-M, dot com. We now have over 4,000. Last time I was here, we had a few thousand. But now we have over 4,200 
domains on the internet. And even if I start telling you all the names of them right now, I'll still be here next week with no sleep, no time to eat, still talking and still not going through half of them because there's that many. But I will tell you one that you can get access to a lot of them. Shareislam.com. And it's set up like the games that the kids like to play. You like to go play games? Have you seen some games on the Game Boy or something like this? Yeah? All right. So we made it like that so you could just like move it with your finger on your phone or use your mouse on the computer and you see these lovely pictures. And each one of the sections, it's actually a website, different websites. But each of these sections has questions. And you can click it and it will give you the answer. Simple answers. Sometimes they're a little bit like college level because they're answered by some big scholars and we tried to bring it down to a level we could all understand but still it's, it gets pretty uh, involved. And I want to encourage us to do that because we really do have a lot of our Muslims today that don't have the basics. And this will help you a lot. Does God exist? Yes, but how do you know? How can you prove it without a doubt? And one of the things, there's many, there's many things you can use your common sense. But I want to use something for Muslims and Christians and Jews. The prophets are those who brought the proof with them through their mu'ajaza, through the miracles that they do. And those people could see. Because they said, well, if we don't see it, we don't believe it. Oh, no, no, no. Hold on. They were right in front of them and they did miracles. For instance, in the case of Jesus, peace be upon him, one of the miracles that we know about, he formed up clay. Clay. He formed this little bird's out of clay and then they became real birds and they flew away in the case and this is mentioned in hadith how about in the Quran talking about birds that Ibrahim Abraham peace be upon him he's asking Allah about some proof he asked for proof this is Surah Baqarah right after a few ayahs after Ayatul Kursi he's asking Allah for proof and Allah is asking him, like, what? You got a problem with proof? Is your, your belief, your iman is weak or what? And no, 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 no. I just want to have some, something, you know, to kind of boost it up. I'm giving Texas translation to this. You know that, right? Okay. Anyway, so here's the proof. Allah told him, take some of these birds and cut them up. Make like the biha on the birds. And then take these pieces and put different pieces on different mountains. Okay? And then go back and then call them. Call these birds. And they all came back together and flew back to him. The case of Jesus mentioned in Quran, also mentioned in the Bible. Is a, in the Bible they tell you who is the name, somebody named Lazarus. He's dead. He's dead. But when Jesus, peace be upon him, goes to this man, the man comes back to life. We say by the permission of Allah. And this is a very good point because you understand we don't worship any of the prophets. We don't pray to Abraham. We don't pray to Adam. We don't pray to Jesus, we don't pray to Moses, we don't pray to Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon them all. But what we do, we pray to the God they told us to pray to. Now before we take this break, I want to just tell you there's a, a verse in the Bible that the people asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Well, the first commandment said there's no God beside God. That's what it says in the book of Exodus. But now in the New Testament, it said that they asked Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? And look what he told them. 
This is in the Bible in the English translation. It said, it is to know, O Israel. Who is he talking to? The children of Israel. Yeah? Beni Israel. That's what it says in the Quran. He's talking to them. He said, it's to know, O Israel, the Lord your God is one Lord. And him you have to worship with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul, and all your strength, and a commandment like unto it, to love your brother as yourself. We're going to talk about that when we come back and wrap up our program. So stay tuned, stay right where you are, and stay guided. We'll guide us TV. Okay, short one, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I know. Thank you. They told you to say that? All right. So whenever we come back, they want me to bring in the, what's our subject for tonight. Okay. Right after this. So it's not really a commercial, <clears throat> but <laughs> sort of. Alhamdulillah. How many seconds? Can we do something about this noise in the background that really is going to go out and it doesn't sound right to the people watching at home? Yeah, torturing small children does not sound good. In the Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen and we are back and we are trying to get uh, something to slow down this activity we got in the background. I know it sounds like uh, we've got a bunch of crazy dogs and cats fighting, but that's not really the case. We're just having a good time here tonight. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. I was mentioning something just a few minutes ago from the Bible, but we have something also in Islam as strong or maybe even stronger telling us the importance of taking care of each other because it said in the bible a commandment like the first commandment is to love your brother as yourself we have something even stronger we have in islam to care for people even if they're not your so-called people because they are people even if somebody is not a Muslim, you still have to care for them. We mentioned this. Somebody was putting trash on Prophet Sassam's doorstep and then what he did. So he wanted to take care of that person. And I think that this makes a lot of sense. It makes a whole lot of sense in that that shows people that you are really bigger and above just retaliating about everything. If somebody took a key, and this happened to a brother, took a key and walked along his car, and they, they call it keying somebody's car. He scratched his car the whole length, a real nice, expensive car. I know what would have happened to that person in Texas if they would have seen what happened. But instead, he said, may Allah forgive them. And I looked at him like, that was your car, right? <laughs> he said, yeah. And all you're saying is, may Allah forgive me. He said, actually, I need to pray for that person. <clears throat> That's not what I grew up with. You just scratched my car for no reason? What? But he said, look, and this is, this is Islam. Whenever somebody does something like that, it means there's a reason in their head maybe they don't like Islam maybe they don't like us maybe maybe this guy has a problem but whatever it is I hope Allah will guide him because I'm not perfect either and I hope Allah will guide me so I will pray for him to be guided does it make sense I'm like mm, kinda sorta let me get more information the more I study Islam the more I see this is the behavior of a real believer when I read it in the Bible, I said, well, okay, that's because he's a prophet, you know. He said nice things about Jesus and he, what he did, peace be upon him. But, hey, I'm not a prophet, so I don't have to be good like that, right? No, you're supposed to. 
You're supposed to forget. How about this one? When it's, it's said in the Bible, now I'm, I'm talking, of course, to a lot of Christians out there, but still, it's said if somebody slaps you on the cheek or hits you on the cheek, give them the other cheek. I didn't grow up with that. I heard it. Oh, don't, don't get me wrong. I heard it every Sunday, right? Oh, I got that. But that's not what I saw. I promise you that is not what I saw growing up. But a human being who can rise above this retaliation idea and really serve other people, even if it takes something away from them, they don't mind because they understand there's a bigger picture. There's a bigger outcome. There is a bigger life waiting for all of us. A bigger and better place waiting for you. This is the teaching of the Jews, the Christians, and the Muslims. All of us are sharing this. And if you really understand the basis of what this is, foundation, the foundation of the whole thing, in Arabic, Mosasa, foundation, yeah? So think, how am I treating my family? How am I treating the other Muslims around me? How do I treat the people that I can't see, but I know that they're there, they need help? What am I doing about that? And what about even my enemies? How many people really have you ever heard of that actually pray for their enemies instead of praying against them? You have leaders of countries that you make fun of, that you joke about, that you insult, that you say things, you put stuff on the internet attacking your own leaders. And then you wonder why Allah makes things worse. Isn't it Allah who put the leaders over us, yes or no? If you know that, what is the instruction coming from our Prophet And a longer hadith, it takes a long time to explain, but it's talking about Nasiha. Adina Nasiha. The Prophet he said that. People translate it to say that it means give good advice. It's not wrong, but it's not right. Because there's more to the hadith, because they said to who? Now you're going to be surprised, maybe. And maybe you heard the first part, you didn't hear the rest of it. To who am I giving this? Nisiha. He, he said, to Allah. Are you going to advise Allah? I'd like to know what you're thinking about on that day. And his book. How do you advise the Quran? Excuse me, I don't get that. And his prophet. So I saw him. And the Wali Amr, the one who is responsible for all of the people and to the general public. So this needs a lot of qualification and explanation. But the bottom line is the Wali Amr, the one who is the leader of your company, country, you have to be given nasiha, which is not just advice, it's support. To support the good that they do. Every person has some good and some bad and it's not up to me to decide how much good or how much bad pray for the good of the people ask a lot to guide the people and you'll be surprised how much better off you're going to be the people around you are going to be and then in general what happens for all of us now our program tonight we're about to go off the air in about a few seconds i just want to mention that those at home can support this channel and they can also support the program we're doing tonight. You also, all you guys watching us all the time, you know how to text to 71777. I'm asking you to do it right now. Send the word, it's, a, it's letters. M-W-O-L, M-W-O-L. And I'll explain it to you that are here right now. We've only got a couple of seconds left. I just mentioned this. You are supporting orphans that you don't see, but they are in a desperate situation. Do that right now. And inshallah, Allah guide all of us. Stay tuned. Stay guided with Guidance TV.
All right. So what I was talking about, hey, pull out your cell phone real quick and I'll show you something. It's not maybe. Pull it out. Okay. Don't make me come over there. I am from Texas. You know that, right? I'm not going to come and give you a massage, all right? Pull out the cell phone. All right. Thank you. Now, what I want you to do right this minute is to send a word. Well, it's not a word. It's the letters. M W O L. M W O L. It stands for Mercy Without Limits. Mercy Without Limits. Now, when you do this, it'll ask you some of the, especially on smartphones, it will say, are you sure you want to do this? Maybe it's going to charge your phone. It will not. It will send you back a link. Then you click the link. Every, who's the first one that got it? Yeah, congratulations, brother. May Allah let you be first in the Jannah, me. And then Allah let me be second so I can make sure you made it okay. <laughs> All right. The phone number is 71777. The phone number is 71777. It's a special number that... Uh, Hello, somebody call Hello? Hello? Hello, somebody come. What's the matter? Okay, we're still working here. <laughs> okay, somebody come. I'll call you later. I thought maybe it's an emergency. Uh, anyway. So, this will send you a link back. You click the link, and then you can see the project. Tonight's project is something we just now put it all over the world. I, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of people just went, what was that, you know? But they will probably do it to find out what it is. What we have, and the brother's going to tell you all about it right now because he's got it firsthand. But what I heard him say this morning really touched me. I really want to do whatever I can. and I'm encouraging you to do whatever you can. You can do it several ways. Number one. You can just give cash tonight. But if you do that, you get some reward. But I always like to encourage myself and others to do this. Whatever you were thinking, I want to do maybe $1,000. Okay, that's nice. But I would encourage you to do just like $60 or something like that every month from now on. You know why? Maximum reward with Allah. Let's look at that. What did Rasulullah said? It means in English that Allah loves. Now, who is, we're talking about Allah Azwajal, the one who created everything. This is what he loves. So pay attention. I want, him, I want him to love me too. So Allah loves the thing that you do regularly. Even if it's small. More than the thing that you do is big, but you only do it one time. And it's easier, isn't it? Financially, it's easier on you. Just do a little bit, a little bit, but just keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. Keep it going. That's the same thing we tell people to do for Guidance TV. And by the way, I told you about the box earlier. We don't sell the box. We just let people pay for the service every month, every month, and we give the box away free. And people come to Islam from that. But this isn't about our box tonight. I'm not even going to tell you what to do on that. I want you to pay close attention because we are going to get huge rewards tonight for helping little orphan children who are in these refugee camps. And from you know, everybody heard about the Rohingya Muslims. I don't think and I have to tell you about that. Also, what happened in Syria, what's going on in Turkey. Our brother is going to give you the whole lowdown on it right now. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Sheikh Yusuf. Inshallah, we'll have a question and answer after the Asha. Inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. Bismillah wa salatu wasalam wa rasulullah. I have the honor to stand before you tonight, my dear brother and sister in Islam, on behalf of an organization called the Mercy Without Limits. 
this organization, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, has many programs, but we focus on only two programs, orphans and the Rohingya Muslims. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, we have offices around nine countries, subhanAllah. And as we specialized in taking care of orphans, Alhamdulillah, each orphan gets seven programs. Maybe you can visit our website, inshallah Rabbil Alameen, and to find out more about what are these programs. But, subhanAllah, to sponsor one orphans, those orphans, those children that they supposed to grow up with safety, uh, uh, humanity, uh, uh, school, education, subhanAllah, they've been deprived of all of that. And they don't know what happened to them. They don't know why they became orphaned, subhanAllah. Uh, some of them, they don't know how to read or write. Some of them, they don't even know how to read the, the Al-Fatiha, subhanAllah. I mean, they have seen more death than life. Imagine, imagine those are, subhanAllah, la qadar Allah, those were our children, what are we going to do? And I'm here tonight, why? Because other people, we all know who are these people, are ready to take these orphan Muslims. They are willing to uh, host those uh, orphan Muslims and to teach them their Christianity. SubhanAllah, if we are not going to sponsor our own children, who will? What you gonna get when you sponsor an orphan? To sponsor an orphan is sixty dollars a month. Subhanallah, I mean, just sixty dollars. What can you do with sixty dollars a month? Maybe you can buy some groceries. Maybe you put gas in your car with sixty dollars a month. I'm I'm not raising funds. This is number one, brother and sister. I'm not raising funds, but I'm I'm showing you what's about the orphans. Subhanallah, sixty dollars a month. What you going to get? Number one, the maghfirah, rahmah, the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Number two, inshallah, you will be the companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in al-Jannah because sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, whoever sponsors a yatim, an orphan, will be my companion like this in al-Jannah. What else you going to get? You going to get something like that. A brief report. It shows the picture of the orphan that is sponsor. It shows the age, what school they go to, how many times they go to school, how many times they are seen by a doctor, everything you need to know. And if you are a resident of one of these countries, we have seven, uh, nine countries. When you go back, maybe we can arrange for you to meet your orphans. Or we can also facilitate to talk to him over the phone, inshallah rabbil alameen. So it is $60 a month, inshallah rabbil alameen. And the, the whole blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, it will be open for you. I'm not raising funds, my dear brother and sister in Islam, but you can do it in two different ways. Either as the Sheikh have uh, told us through the phone, or just, let's see, just very quickly, inshallah rabbil alameen. If you want to sponsor an orphan, just take one of those and that's it. You want to mail it, you want to give it to me after you finish, that's up to you. Anyone would like to sponsor an orphan? Bismillah. Bismillah. Anyone? Bismillah. I'm not reading Allahu Akbar. Can someone help us, uh, inshallah, send those to the back people, inshallah, Rabbil Amin? Barakallah fikum, inshallah, Rabbil Amin. Anyone? Just fill it out, inshallah, Rabbil Amin, give it back to me. Bismillah. Bismillah. Can you give it to him? Bismillah. We have four so far. How many orphans we can get from this masjid? I know that you are generous community. Bismillah. Jazakumullah khairan shikhna. Anyone else, inshallah, Rabbil Amin? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. We have five, six, inshallah. Bismillah. Can you give it to the back of the chat? Come, come, Habibi. Habibi. Bismillah. Bismillah. Seven so far. Anyone else? Anyone else, inshallah. If you want to write it down now, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bismillah. We have 380 dollars so far. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Bismillah. Anyone else, inshallah? Anyone else? Bismillah. Yes. Okay. In the back, inshallah. Bismillah. We have five, six, seven, inshallah. In the back, yes. Uh, eight. Can somebody, inshallah? Can you give this, inshallah? Come on, Habibi. Come, inshallah. Bismillah. Just fill them out whenever you want. You want to give it to me, you want to send it by mail. Inshallah khair, we have more. But it is a commitment between you and Rabbil Alameen. Subhanallah, Rabbil Alameen. We are here today, Subhanallah, Rabbil Alameen. Tonight, Subhanallah. In the back also, ya akhi, Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala has decided for you to come here just to listen to me. What you going to do with that? We are going to be asked and question about it. Anyone would like more of these, inshallah, Rabbil Amin? More of those, subhanallah, Rabbil Amin? If you want to save it till Ramadan, that's fine, inshallah. Subhanallah, we are not rushing you, we are not pushing you, but it's a khair, subhanallah, Rabbil Amin. We don't know. I want to make sure that when I die, you guys take care of my children, subhanallah, Rabbil Amin. That's what's happening right now. 
Nobody imagined that this is happening in our country. Subhanallah rabbil alamin. Anyone else, inshallah, uh, would like to take one of those? Barakallahu feek. Barakallahu feek. Bismillah. Anyone more? Anyone? Bismillah. Last chance, inshallah. We'll have time, inshallah, to make wudu. Yes? Yeah, we have time to make wudu, inshallah, rabbil alamin. Anyone? Last call? Bismillah. Uh, you? Uh, listen to this. Allahu Akbar. Listen to this. Come on. Come on. Is it for you or for your dad? Huh? That's for, her, for his dad, subhanAllah. And give it around, inshallah, rabbil alameen. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah. This is what we need to teach our children, inshallah, rabbil alameen. I'm not going to mention any ayat. I'm not going to mention any hadith for sadaqa or the charity. No, I'm sure that you have a wonderful imam that and you all of you knows all these ayat and those hadith, inshallah, rabbil alameen. Barakallahu feekum. Jazakumullah khairin. I'll be waiting outside. If you want to donate cash, khair wa baraka. If you want to fill out those uh, pledge cards and give it back to me, khair wa baraka. Whatever you want to do, just do it, inshallah, rabbil alameen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept every single penny. If you don't have nothing but dollar in your pocket, just put it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will accept it from you. Jazakum Allah khairan, barakallahu feekum. We'll get ready for Aisha, inshallah. Then we'll have a question and answer with the sheikh, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Hu Aladi Jalna Muslimin Wa Salat Wa Salam Al Sula Wa Kareem Alhamdulillah Brothers I'm so happy to have this chance to be with you again after so long a period of not being here and I would love really to have the time to just stay and talk and have fun and all that but there's something that our Sheikh just said that really touched my mind and heart at the same time. How would it be if I was sitting in one of those refugee camps right now, me now, just watching those children, just watching the people, seeing what's going on. Now, I have a lot of video that I've seen the brothers brought back from these different places, especially the Rohingya Muslims but not to make one over the other because they're all people and they all need help. I wish I could do something really big. I mean, if, if I was a billionaire, that would be cool, right? If I had like a whole billion dollars, I could just like donate that, get a big reward with the law, of course, and help all these kiddos, all these people. You know what's wrong with that? Besides the fact that I don't have a billion dollars. What's wrong with that? That is not what Allah created the world for anyway. The whole entire world is created for a test on all of us. That's why it's here. This is not our Jannah. Is this our Jannah? Is this what you're trying to do? Are you really trying to make this be your Jannah? Because if you are, you've got a problem. Rasulullah Sallallahu he said, Ad-dunya sijnu mu'min wa jannah to kafir. This world that we live in is a prison to a true believer. A true believer is your prison. What happens in prison? Well, number one, you don't get the things you want. Is that right? Number two, some prisons, they'll hurt you. Right? And sometimes this is what we feel. I don't get the things I want and sometimes I feel hurt. But on the other side of this, well, there's one more thing. What else happens in prison? You can never be with the ones you get to love, that you love so much you can't be with them. You know why? That's why they put you in prison. How does that compare? Well, as a Muslim, 
There are things I'm not supposed to do, right? I have limits. Clothing, food, drink, all kinds of limits that I've, nope, you can't do that. Nope, you can't do that. Nope, you can't do that. The biggest thing, though, is when it comes down to being with the one you love the most. We love Muhammad Sallallahu more than we love ourselves. And we love Allah. And imagine being in paradise, being close. Huh? But the rest of the hadith, it says, and this is scary part. What genital kafir. The paradise for a disbeliever. Paradise for a disbeliever. So that means what? This is their paradise. Then after this, the, 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 what they get next will not be as good as this. And this is not all that great. Where you're sitting right now, do you feel any pain? Do you feel anything in your legs? You're tired of sitting here. Maybe you feel like, oh, my back, this or that. Or my neck. or bleh. Huh? You will not feel that in Jannah. But the worst day of your whole life. The worst day of your whole life will be like paradise compared to Nari Jahannam. You imagine this? Oh, and this is from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi telling us. But what did Allah create the whole entire scenario we call the dunya, hayat the dunya? What, why, why? He told us in the Quran. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنْسِ إِلَّا لِعَبَدُونَ Surah Adariyat. He said, what means in English? He did not create. He did not create all of the jinn and human beings except for what? Except for what? Ibadah. So if you said, well, okay, what's the big deal? The big deal is that he just told you what the test is. That's your test. Will you put anything ahead of Allah and his messenger? And you say, no, 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 I'm a good Muslim. Oh, really? So of all the people on the planet today, there's about 7 billion people on the planet. Is that right? Huh? And only... 300 million are living in this country and not all of them are rich that's for sure <clears throat> in fact after this latest administration change I think there's a lot more of us who are not rich but I don't want to get into that subject the thing that I'm saying is we have more us right now than the vast majority of people on the earth And if you said, oh, brother, you don't know my condition. <laughs> what I do know is the condition of some people, and I've been in these countries and I've seen it to the extent. You take water for granted or do you go to water and you say, wow, this little drop of water is so nice. No, you never do that. I've been in countries and I've watched people not have enough water to wash their clothes to take a shower even to make wudu even to brush their teeth even to cook or even just to drink one lady in one of these countries living out in the desert area she asked me a question she said Sheikh because Ramadan was coming up in two weeks she said do you think that Allah will accept our fasting if we can't break the fast? The question made it real obvious to me. She was sincere. She wanted to know for sure. I want to know if Allah is going to break, uh, accept if I don't have any water to even water to break the fast. I wanted to just cry right then. Because we have so much we take for granted. Another lady, I asked the translator, this is all through translation, Swahili and Somali language. 
And subhanAllah, I'm asking this lady, tell us how you're going to feel after we get these wells. We're putting wells in over there. The, they drill the hole, the government drills the hole, and then you come along and you put the equipment to get the water up. And it costs a lot of money to do it, but that will last and go on and go on for a long, long time. So we did this, and we told her we were raising money in England, like for eight or nine wells. We were able to do 13, and I felt so good because we actually did more than what we thought we could do. And so what I was asking the lady just to talk about when we finish the one for their community, how she's going to feel. Because you can, and I told her, I, I told them to tell her in their language, now you'll be able to brush your teeth, make wudu, take a shower, wash your clothes, children can play in the water, and the goats and sheep can run through the water, and everybody's going to be happy. Tell us about that. And then I want to put that on the camera. I'm going to show it to the brothers and sisters when we get back so they can see what we did. And she said something, and then the translator looked at me and he said, she just said, no. I said, what? What the heck did you tell her? Let me try that again. Okay, what's it going to be like when you're able to brush your teeth and so on, so on, so on, all the water and everything? Huh? She said, it would be bad. I think it would be bad. She's like, are you saying what I'm saying to this lady? I said, yeah. She just told us she had 10 children. Five of them died in her arms because of lack of water, lack of food. They, she couldn't, her breasts would not make milk enough to keep the baby alive. She just got to tell us that. Maybe the son got her or something. You know, I'm thinking, you know, what's wrong with this lady? I said, okay, ask her why she said that. I got to know. Camera or no camera, I got to know why she said that. When the translator gave me the answer, I, I couldn't say anything. We had to turn the camera off because I started crying. She said, I'm afraid we'll forget Allah. I said later, that lady became a bigger sheikha to me than all of the ulama that I met. Because she demonstrated in front of me what it really means. What it really means to love Allah. That you're willing to give up everything and anything just so you can have your heart talking to Allah every day. Brothers, and sisters that are listening to me right now don't pass this opportunity to establish an ongoing relationship with somebody else on this earth who really can get their prayers answered they're in a position anything these children ask for from Allah don't you think he's going to answer them and if they're making dua for you what is this going to be you start seeing things happen that are good. Don't think for a minute it's because, oh, I'm good, I'm great. No, no, it's Allah. He's doing that simply because they're making dua for you. So if you haven't done it already, I don't know how to tell you more clear than this. Pull out your phone right now and you're going to see what's happening around the world because these places, somebody donated $2, by the way. I saw it happen two dollars but you can go on this link right now and you're going to watch it going because it's going right now um pull out your phone now pull out your phone is your father talking to you pull out your phone all right now send the word uh, it's letters m w o l send that word to 71777 by the way don't call that and try to talk to me it's not a talking number it's a text number we'll send you back the link and if you say well I don't want to do anything tonight okay fine good but do that so you can see what's happening
oh yeah that's a good idea I told you earlier today I need you to do this kind of stuff because you're smart he mentioned something be sure you share this link with as many people as you can if you have a Facebook account or some social media send it if you have phone numbers of your friends send it tell them just all you got to do take that link you see the link when it comes copy it and send the link don't tell them how to do 71777 don't tell them about the word no no just send them the link you know why because in the campaign it will go on your credit of course Allah will keep it for your credit anyway but you'll get the credit for whatever little bit that somebody might do it'll be on your account it'll say you donated X amount of thousands of dollars you're like whoa <laughs> I just did sixty dollars a month <laughs> how many of you did it are you looking at it you seeing it what does it say now huh 792 isn't there somebody who wants to make eight dollars on to make it 800 come on guys you can do it right now watch it'll change a minute ago shake was looking at it. he said 380 dollars and right after that it said 382 dollars <laughs> i know somebody and by the way in california on ours you send the word islam to 71777 and then you'll get the link back to see how to support the tv channel but a boy was sending us a dollar a month and he sent a letter he said he's seven years old he's sending his dollar every month he said don't let my tv channel go off the air now my wife always sends something back to people that donate you know she was spending more than the dollar for the envelope and the stamp and the insert to send it back to him and thank him and i asked her why are you doing this she said because it's not about the money it's about the relationship that little boy keeps praying for us and we're still on the air alhamdulillah hmm? if, if i know the answer you can ask anything you want but you got to ask a question that i know the answer to so it makes me look smart before islam oh because of islam ah what happened good to me because of islam as soon as i came to islam immediately immediately i never had been robbed in my life really i got robbed in two places north texas and south texas the same week everything gone that was immediate that, yes it is what happened next my own family turned against me my own family my mother oh i love very much my father everybody turned against me now my father later helped me a lot and he came to islam alhamdulillah but initially that was a big problem then the next thing well you said what happened good all right so that was a good thing right my family they said don't ever come around anymore and these were people i used to go and preach the bible and talk to them and you got to believe go to church everything everything you know so the next thing happens after this in my own family my when we you know when arabs say family they're talking about their wife they don't want to say my wife they say their family you're right you know that right okay so now you know anyway there was a problem coming up there and i said well i never had this before how do i have this problem then somebody kidnapped one of my children my daughter out of a masjid so far i'm just telling you the good news i lost my business completely zero income the vehicles that i had i had one suburban completely paid for brand new it got stolen and we couldn't find the papers to with the id and the stuff on it because we had moved and it got auctioned off by the police department and then when we found it it was too late they said sorry that's it nothing you can do about it oh. then 
It gets even better. I wound up, no clothes, no house, no family. Pretty good, huh? It gets better. I had to sleep in the masjid. But with no clothes, I had to get the clothes out of the donation box in the back. They didn't fit. And it was all Pakistani stuff, you know what I mean? <laughs> with the rope. You know, do you ever see with the rope, you have to tie it? <laughs> Alhamdulillah for the Velcro that they have now and for the, you know, ex what do you call it? Elastic? Yeah. Alhamdulillah for that. But back then we didn't have it. This is almost 30 years ago. But you know what it did? It made me keep going back to Allah, asking Him, asking Him, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, Oh Allah, help me. Oh Allah, why? Is it? Oh Allah, help me. In the essence, in the back of my mind, I know there's a reason for what Allah is doing. One thing that did not happen, I never got sick. I didn't really get, you know, like ill or something like Ayub. You know the story of Ayub, right? Job in the Bible. He had the diseases and he lost everything. And I kept thinking about Job because it's a whole book in the Bible, by the way, about him. And so I was thinking about that and I said, look, if a prophet can take it, even with the sickness, even with the disease, I got to be able to be stronger. It was only, it seemed like a hundred years, but it was really only about 11 months. That's all it was. 11 months. But all of a sudden, things started going the other way. One of the things that I did was to go with some brothers, spend some time, just for the sake of Allah. And when I did that, things started changing. I spent time listening, trying to learn, go along, learning Quran, learning more how to pronounce the words. Because at first I didn't do any of that. I just do the salah with the brothers and that don't really know what we're saying or what we're doing but hey I like it it's good but when I got really serious about the deen to the extent that this is my job this is what I want to do and then learn how to tell other people about it things changed step by step I got a new wife alhamdulillah and I got a new life I got my daughters back and they became really good Muslims, alhamdulillah. And I saw things happening around me that every day, even today, I see things happening and I know with no doubt that it's all part of Allah's plan. It is going to be all right, no matter what happens to you. So I, I want to end by saying that I, I res respect our brother's question. And actually, you give me a good chance to bring up something that normally I don't ever talk about it. I never do. Because I don't want people to think I'm complaining. Because it was a learning process. You don't complain about going to college because you got a lot of knowledge out of it. You got a certificate. You got something or a jazz or something. So for sure I, re I respect what people are going through. Because ultimately if you don't have this test how can you pass it? You have to have the test to pass it. And we have to pass the test to go to Jannah. And this is our goal. This is why we're here. And I'll end with the, the same ayah I began with. Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ jinn wal ins إِلَّ abadun." He did not create any of us except to test us. I'm adding that in there. To test us in our worship of him. Put Allah first and everything is going to be fine. you never lose on that. And stay tuned and stay guided with Guidance TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استووا تراصوا اعتدلوا straighten the lines fill in the gaps الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله ولتنظر نفس ما قدمت لغد واتقوا الله إن الله خبير بما تعملون ولا تكونوا كالذين نسوا الله فأنساهم أنفسهم أولئك هم الفاسقون 
لا يستوي أصحاب النار وأصحاب الجنة أصحاب الجنة هم الفائزون لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو عالم الغيب والشهادة هو الرحمن الرحيم هو الله الذي لا إله إلا هو الملك القدوس السلام المؤمن المهيمن العزيز الجبار المتكبر سبحان الله عما يشركون هو الله الخالق البارئ المصور له الأسماء الحسنى يسبح له ما في السماوات والأرض وهو العزيز الحكيم الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله 
الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر سمع الله لمن حمده الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله استغفر الله استغفر الله السلام عليكم That was weak. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Rasulullah wa ra'ari wa ashabi ajma'in. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashadu an Muhammadan abaduhu wa rasul. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Really quick, um, I know that we were talking about doing a Q&A after the Isha, but I know that Sheikh Yusuf is, uh, he needs to get out of here. <laughs> we, we haven't had anything to eat since this morning. And um, don't do it, don't do it. He's gonna do it anyways. Really quick though, um, if you guys do have questions, by the way, I would ask you, barakallahu feekum, save it, you can email us at contact at guideus.tv. If you have any questions for Sheikh Yusuf, we get it all the time, and you can always contact us through guideus.tv. Um, if you have any questions about why we're here tonight, it is with the uh, Mercy Without Limits organization as uh, Brother Muhammad Hassan who is downstairs. You can catch up more information with him inshallah. But uh, Sheikh Yusuf will close out the program inshallah. Barakallahu feek.
ان الحمد لله رب العالمين هو الذي جعل المسلمين والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله الكريم وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين شر ولا اله الا الله شر محمد عبده ورسوله السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته it's strange that i just told you guys that of all the things that happened one thing it didn't happen was health issue right as i said that I was starting to lose my eyesight. And I was telling the brother about this, and Zala uh, Khair, he stepped up right away to help out. But I think I figured out what it was. Some, I don't know if you know about the intensity of lights, but when somebody has a camera and they take a flash picture, that split second that that flash is on, can hurt your eyes. But if it stays on and they use that to record and you look at that, it can damage your eyes permanently. So I just want to mention that so that you guys don't stare at a welding machine when it's going and don't stare at a light like that. And uh, I, I think that that is, because several people had them going at the same time. I think that's what it was because it's not so bad now. Anyway, enough about all that. If anybody have anything you would like to bring up as a question, something that you feel like you need to ask, like I said earlier, just be sure I know the answer because it makes me look smart. You know? I like that. No, we have a limit, only one per customer. No, it's okay, go ahead. His name is Jesus, son of Mary. Did you know that? Isa Ibn Maryam. And your hometown is Bethlehem. Uh, you're not going to try to tell us anything else, are you? <laughs> I'm getting scared. I, uh... I like you to tell me. Alex, what is Jesus' nationality? What's his nationality? Because you're American, I am. He is Pakistani. What is his nationality? Well, if he's born in Philistine, he's Philistine. <laughs> That's easy. But... Some people, especially from the Yahudi, will say their nationality is Jewish. That is not a nationality. That's not, yeah, because they say the Jewish nation is what they talk about. But actually, that could be debated. The thing that it is, it's a tribal name more than it is anything else. Like somebody could be Habashi from uh, Africa, or they could be uh, Tamimi from the uh, ancient uh, Arabs. Philistine. No, that's mispronunciation, the same word. Like Asa. That's your name. I like it. You don't need to tell people you're Jesus, right? They lock you up anyway, for you know. <laughs> I'm Jesus. Oh, yeah? <laughs> right. <laughs> Not yet. Lay the bad. Inshallah. Make dua. Yeah. I just came back from, uh, I think I mentioned this, I just came back from uh, another holy land. Yeah. They took all my hair. Can you figure out where it was? <laughs> it wasn't Pakistan. They'll take anything but not hair. <laughs> Anybody here from Pakistan? Up Pakistan say hey. Up Pakistan say hey. Aji. May Texas stand to who? You want to hear it in Arabic? Huh? In, in Arabic? Huh? Ana Saidi min Texas stand. You know Saidi, yeah? <laughs> With, huh? You want to ask this question? You want to know how many wives? When I got married, listen to this. I married a girl from Texas. She's a, a Texas girl convert to Islam like me. Now imagine. When we get married, look what she said. She said, as a Muslim man, you can have four wives. And I want you to have your rights. I was like, really? She said yes. So you should have four wives. Wow. 
okay. I don't know what I would do with them, but it sounds good, right? She said, just keep in mind, one from Texas equal four from anywhere else. I said, wow. Man, I hit that one right on the first go. Hey, all right. I'm not exactly sure what it means, but it sounds good, right? Alhamdulillah. Next question. Oh, wait a minute. I got something else about that. When, now, this is serious. This is not a joke. When we got married, her sister gave her an iron skillet. Now, if you don't know what's an iron skillet, it's a big pan, but it's made out of iron, not aluminum, not Teflon. It's iron, and they used to cook everything with them, but then if you're not careful, your food sticks to it, and it burns up, and it, all kind of stuff. So when she got this big, big skillet like this, and I said, uh, why your sister give you that? It doesn't have Teflon, and it does you, you. She said, it's not for cooking. <laughs> okay. Ah. Uh, you ever been hit with an iron skillet? <laughs> yeah, I want to keep it that way too, you know what I mean? But then she told me about a story that is a true story. When her folks, they were in the military, when they were in England, there was a commotion in the apartment above them. These were not military people, they were from England. There was a big commotion and the police came. And when the police came, they found the man of the house in his bed but he had a sheet over him and safety pins all the way around the, the holding the sheet down on him and when they opened up they found all of his bones are broken everything every, all his ribs are broken his legs are broken his head is smashed up everything is it, you, you want to know what happened okay the story is that he used to drink alcohol and he would come home and he would beat his wife every time every time and she tolerated this she put up with it because she has children and he's the one taking care of everything but then one night he got drunk and he came in and he started beating up the children so she waited when he fell asleep she took a sheet she put it over him, put the safety pins around it and got a you know what's a cricket bat Anybody ever held a cricket bat? It's heavy. It's really hard. Yeah. Cricket bat. And he was screaming and screaming and screaming till somebody called the police and then that he lived. And the judge didn't do anything to her. And he was the nicest man and he never drank any more alcohol after that. So a safety pins and a cricket bat will cure you from being an alcoholic. <laughs> Just thought I'd mention that. It's a sad thing when a man takes advantage of his position and especially it's a real bad thing, even worse, when he said it's from Islam. There's an ayah in Quran that is misrepresented in English, I don't know how it is in Urdu, but in English it's a bad translation of an ayah. The ayah has a word in it, Baraba. Our Sheikh from actually Mansura, if you know it's where Mansura. He's from Mansura. Of course. He's from Mansura too. Yeah. Oh, you're from Mansura. Ah, okay. Well, one Sheikh, his name Sheikh Muhammad, I asked him about this word one time. What is Daraba? He knows I'm trying to learn Tafsir of Quran. And so he smiled and he said, I'm wondering how long it's taking you to get to this word. Because he knows the ayah that I'm thinking about. Wadribahuna. So the Sheikh, he stood up and he started coming toward me like this like this I said well, this is Darba 
He said, yes, this is Darba. Now, what I'm referring to, what Dribuhuna in the Quran is about something a man can do to his wife. I said, you can walk on your wife? He said, no, no, no. This is Darba, one meaning of the word. is striding, like a rhythm that you have walking on. Then he said, also, he gave another example. Whenever you play, ba anybody play baseball, you see baseball on TV, you know what baseball is? They throw the ball and you try to hit it, not like the cricket thing. This is when you try to catch it and somebody could be out. In cricket, if the ball hits you, you're knocked out. You know how that works, right? Anyway. So, anyway. <laughs> I get off the subject. I'm sorry, guys. But... When you think about this daraba, the translation says, strike them. And it's referring to your wife. Strike them. And I, I have a problem with that. Not just because of the frying pan, okay? <laughs> just in general. That a man hitting his wife, especially one of the translations said scourge them s-c-o-u-r-g-e scourge now if you don't know what it is this is a particular kind of hitting reserved for people on a boat that when there's mutiny the people working on the boat want to take it over from the captain it's called mutiny and when they catch them these guys trying to do like a, a takeover of a government kind of a thing you know but then they tie him to the big post in the middle of the boat, take off his shirt, and they start beating him with what's called cat and nine tails, scourging him back and forth till he's bleeding, and then they take salt water and throw it on him. And then they throw him overboard for the sharks. But that, the point is, this thing is called scourging. Uh, I know there's a problem with this, but I can't figure it out. One sheikh was telling us another st subject. He said, if this is true, read the next ayah. The very next ayah, after this ayah in the Quran, is Surah An-Nisa, chapter 4, verse uh, 34. Exactly, 34. 4, 34. In the English translation, anyway. So, if... You look at the next verse, it said, and then if, if there's still not a, a resolution between the two, the man and the wife, then she should get somebody from her family, like her father, and he should get somebody from his family, and they should sit together and try to work it out. Now the sheikh, he's Arab, okay? You know what he told me? He said, number one, Arabs do not have to be told how to mistreat women. They're the experts in mistreating women since before Islam. Yes? Experts in mistreating women is Arabs. Because in Quran you find it mentioned that the baby girl who is asking, for what sin did I commit? Why did they bury me alive? This is the tafsir. Because the Arabs used to be so proud. If I have a baby boy is born, hey, come on over, we're going to celebrate. We had a baby boy. But if he has a girl, ah, oh, uh, this is a big shame. My whole family's shamed now because we, uh, this woman that I'm married to had a girl. Ah, how could she do that to me? This is the attitude they had. They're picking on her. Then they take the baby girl to the desert and bury her alive burning sand, leave the baby in there, and let it die. You want to tell me you have to tell these guys how to be bad? Why do Allah have to say something like that in the Quran? It doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense. Especially, watch this. You just said in Quran, Allah is telling us to go get somebody from her family and somebody from your family, you're going to sit together? Oh yeah, right. Imagine, if you will, just for a minute, the, the scenario of sitting in a tent in the desert, okay? Here's your wife, right, with a black eye, 
uh, broken arm, huh? Because you've been scorching her, right? And now her father walks in with his tribe. You heard about the camel war? 40 years of Arabs killing each other over a camel race. You heard about it? Yeah. What do you think is going to happen when you invite her father in to see what you just did to his daughter? World War III. Doesn't make any sense. Unless you go back and understand more about this word darba. So we wrote a whole article about it, published it. It's in English. You can read it and understand that this word used out of context. And the meaning of nushuzahuna used out of context. And then from the beginning, not understanding what is being represented. The word start, the first word in the ayah is regulin. Regul, male, men are responsible. They use kawi to mean something else. Oh, he's better than, bigger than, greater than the woman. No. The Sheikh said this is his position in front of Allah. Allah made him stronger, but gave him a responsibility to take care of all the women. It's not just your wife. You've got to take care of your mother. You've got to take care of your daughters. You've got to take care of your sisters. You've got to take care of all the women in your household. You've got to take care of your neighbor's family. If they need help, you have the power. Do it. Don't sit around and let little orphan girls, and we, that was our program tonight. Don't sit around and say, oh, well, that's not my problem. No, Allah said it is your problem. And then it goes on to tell you something else. Because it comes to the subject of Nushuzahuna, which means that literally something that doesn't fit. This is out of the picture. This is uh, way out there. Okay? When I first heard it, new shoes, I said, oh, I know that's about women. You know why? They love new shoes. <laughs> ask, ask any woman. You go and look and say, how many new shoes you got? <laughs> All kinds of new shoes. <laughs> but it has nothing to do with shoes. This is something else. And I actually, the reference is that she's doing something that's so bad that it's, it's out of Islam. She shouldn't do this thing. So you're supposed to do what? And now here's what it says. First you advise her or admonish her. These are the two acceptable translations. Why you have to tell him this? So he won't hit her. Because the reaction used to be as soon as she get out of line, boom. Because there are no respect for women. No, no. You have to tell her. Make her understand that this is not acceptable. And then what? Do you notice it said leave the bed? Two things happen. Number one, you, yourself, you get to calm down. Because you don't take any action, at least for the first 24 hours. And you, right? Number two, this, a woman knows when a man is leaving the bed, meaning not to have intimacy with her. And she's going to be like, wow, what's the matter with this guy? He must be serious. Then it says if she continues, you don't get any resolution. One of the meanings, watch this. Hey, I'm talking to you. <laughs> that, I'm sorry, you okay? You okay? But what I just did, it, the sheikh said this is also darba. He's laughing, he's not scared. You're not scared? <laughs> You all right? <laughs> I did that to my kid one time. <laughs> did he scared you? I didn't even look at you. <laughs> but this is the limit. You cannot. How many times you know the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi went around hitting people? Let's see. Anas ibn Malik said he worked for the Prophet Sallallahu as his servant day and night for 10 years 12 years a long time and in all that time not only he didn't hit him he never raised his voice to him he never even said anything harsh to him think about that for a minute try your best to think about how long can you go without raising your voice to 
your wife, to your family, to somebody who work with you? How long? Ten years? How about try ten minutes? Come on. Let's be honest. You know, hey! <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Don't do it again. <laughs> All right. But you get what I'm saying? So, in the Quran, you'll find things that maybe you got the wrong message. But understand that everything in that Quran is from Allah and it all has a good meaning to it for the believers. But when somebody that's not an Arab doesn't really know the Arabic and understanding from the idioms that are used and they try to translate to another language, you're going to have a problem. Most of my programs, I speak English all the way through. I do. But I don't encourage people to study Islam in English. I encourage you to learn it from the Arabia. And because you will make mistakes. I, and I know these mistakes that I made on four big words in the Quran. That, and that was one of them. Daraba. I was telling you about baseball, remember? So if a person swings with a bat and then he misses the ball. If he misses the ball completely, what do they call it? Strike. And if he misses three times, strike out. Huh? I'm not going to do anything. But if, okay, if somebody swings and misses, I did it gently, okay, it's still called a strike. So the, the shiuk that we're explaining is I, uh, three different countries. I, I make sure about this subject because I don't know anything. I want to be sure that this is right. They said, yes, this is a strike. And like, heavy admonition is also this darba. And also, and there's a, another one, a third one. They said at the time of Rasul Sallallahu and even before that, in the Lisan Arabiya, that means the Arabic tongue, there is a meaning that when a camel, male camel, goes to the female camel, they called it Daraba. So one of the meaning could be to go back to the bed and solve the problem. But if you don't get a resolution, now bring the parents in. And again, you see that it couldn't be what you thought because it wouldn't say that in the next unless it, Allah wanted to wipe out all the remaining Muslims on the planet. Alhamdulillah. Some of the other words, you can find the description on this and I'm not going to go into it, but Kital. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Kital. Waktuluhum. Mm -hmm. Translation. Slaughter them. No. It's not the Biha. It's Kital. Simply put, combat. If you use combat in each one of those instances, it becomes clear. People are combat against you, you combat against them. But check this out. It's referring to people wearing ihram. Because they had a superstition about the moon, about entering their house by certain doors, and about wearing ihram. If somebody attacks you, you can't fight back. So people used to rob the people the the hujaj when they're <laughs> trying to go for their rituals the manasik and uh, the rituals that you do in hajj because they know they can't fight back so they rob them or hurt them or rape the women do all bad things so that's another one that becomes more clear when you put it in the spirit of what's being presented Shall we let him do another question? What do you think? Do I did I look smart on that one? Yeah. Hey, cool. Okay. Yeah. Bring it on. <laughs> He's asking some of the things that might amaze you when you visit some of the countries I'm sure you meant the Muslim countries right because I, I saw amazing things in some countries but I can't even talk about it in the masjid <laughs> but they weren't good <laughs> but alright the most amazing 
things that I saw were in Muslim countries. And of all the continents that I visited, Africa was number one. Africa. The, the whole entire continent, it was amazing because I saw so many things. Muslims and from the non-Muslims in Africa. I, it was so amazing. I, if you said, well, pick a place on the planet where you could live in safety, security, and feel good about who you are, there are some places in Africa, from, all the way from Cape Town in the south, as far north as uh, <coughs> if you go to Fes over in uh, Maghreb, or if you go all the way to the Delta in uh, uh, Mesh, in Egypt, there's amazing people and it is the people it's not it's not uh, just about the Nahar Neal or something like the Nile River it's the people they're amazing amazing people and because the Hidayah came to me the guidance came to me from Egypt maybe I'm prejudiced maybe I'm prejudiced but yeah if you said well you have to choose one area I guess I would choose that no, I don't guess. I know I would. <laughs> because, why? The, the wisdom is one thing, but the humor is something else. And I love humor. I love something to make me smile. And the Egyptian people, while I was there the first time, I noticed something. The jokes they tell, and they tell lots of jokes. The jokes that they tell are really something that serious stuff but they make you laugh about it for instance one of the things I noticed right away almost every joke somebody had to die in the joke the guy's dying and he's dead and it's like oh my god and then here's the punchline and you're laughing you're going oh but he died oh what, what is that <coughs> shall I tell you one first I'll give you some ones that somebody didn't die okay Kam Wahid Saidi. How many people from Upper Egypt huh, to change the light bulb? Come Wahid. How many? One? Wahid? That? Thalath. Lesh. Why? Wahid, one of them, he holds the bulb. Okay. The other two turn the ladder <laughs> this joke I heard in Egypt but I heard it first about people in Texas <laughs> then they told another one it's exactly like the one I heard in Texas but instead of a cow it was a camel come <laughs> had Saidi how many people from Upper Egypt to milk the camel? How many? La. La. He said three, Talat. He said two, Ithna. How many? Seven. Oh, camels have the best milk in the world. They have the best milk. Ten? Yes, seriously. Ten? Ten? Divide that in two. Khams. This is khams, Arabic. You know, I'm using an excuse to teach some Arabic few words. Khams. If I say khams, how many is that? Khams. How many? Five? If I say khamsin, how many is that? Fifty? Yeah. How about it? good. All right. So why five people to milk a camel? Well, one holds on to the milker, you know. One holds on to the thing, all right. The other four each grab one leg and raise the camel up and down. <laughs> okay, but now I'm going to try to tell one. This is the last one. I got to go. We got to go, okay. But this is the last one, because this one really hit me, and this is the one where somebody has to die, okay? All right. 
ريدي واحد من مصر ترانسليشن وان بيرسون از فروم ايجيبت هو سعيدي اوكي هي از فروم ابر ايجيبت وهو شيبه اند هي از اولد مان و هو از ريل سيك اند هي از داين اوكي وهو نصراني And he's also a Christian. There are Christians, by the way, that live there in Egypt. Ever since the first Muslim, they didn't kill him. They didn't drive him out. No, they still live there. Okay? All right. So the Christians, Nasrani, they call the Kanisa. That's church. Kanisa. And on the phone, they ask for the Kasis, that's a priest, to come and give the last ritual of the Salib, the cross, on this man. Salib, cross, Kanisa, church, uh, Kasis, priest. Got it? How you feel? It's better to teach it in a joke, right? It's more fun, right? Okay. So they call him. The Kasis comes to the man, the Sheba. Wahuakala. Yes, So the man is saying, The priest is saying to this old man, say, there's none to worship except Allah. The, the shahada for the Muslims. Ya Sheikh, kula ila Allah. Ana Nasrani, Ana Nasrani. He said, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. Ana Masihi. I'm, I'm a, you know, follower of Jesus, you know. He said, nah, nah. Kula ila Allah. He said, oh my God. You know, we, we heard That some of these Kasis, they are, you know, maybe closet Muslim, maybe something like this. Wow. Okay, okay, I'm gonna die. I better say it. Shadow Allah, Shadow Muhammad Rasulullah. And he died. Hua means he. Mot means dead. Okay? Hua Mot. All right. So he's dead. The Kasis. The priest, he says, Alhamdulillah, we got rid of another Muslim. <laughs> you like that? Who is Saidi? I heard that one, and they were translating to me. Uh, similar to what I tried to do tonight. And I picked up on this stuff. And I said, I got to learn this joke. That is so funny. Because, you know, this is talking about people. And how we think. Sometimes we, we think crazy stuff, you know. So I ask Allah, though, that he will use what we talked about tonight. To make all of us closer to him. I mean. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that... What we experience here, the, the good of it, we know it's from Allah, and we can carry that out with us and not be the same people that came in the room. I mean, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He will brighten our lives, brighten our vision, and brighten our hearts for His sake, so that wherever we go, people can see Islam. They don't need to hear us talk about it, but they can feel it. They can know, I met somebody special today. I ask Allah for that for us. Because this is the way of the Sahabi. They, they, wherever they went, people saw Islam. I ask Allah, make that happen for all of us. So people feel and see the real Islam. Ameen. Now I'm going to switch to Arabic. This is some du'as from the Quran. Which means basically, we ask Allah for the good of this life and the good of the next life and to save us from punishment of hell. Then also uh, ask Allah that after he has guided us that he don't let our hearts deviate away and keep us on the Surat al-Mustaqeen. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasan wa fi la kirti hasan wa kina dhaba nar Rabbana la tuzik kulu bana ba'da idh hadaytana wa hab lana mila yuduka rakma in akhan to wa hab اللهم صل على محمد وعلى علي محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى علي إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد إن الحمد لله رب العالمين 
Who will love thee? John the Muslimin. That part that I say all the time, you hear me say it on the TV? We say, Alhamdulillah, Allah thee. The praise be to the one. Ja'alna, who made us Muslims. Muslimin. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, by the way, uh, we have uh, food, so when you're going downstairs, take, take some food, inshallah. Uh, and we would like to thank our guests uh, who came here. I think it was a very inspiring evening. Uh, I cannot say more than that. <laughs> very inspiring. Jazakumullah khair wa salamu alaikum.